Hello and welcome to Devil's Chess Club. I'm Aaron Good, author of American Exception, Empire, and the Deep State, and the host of the American Exception podcast on Patreon. This is the second episode of Devil's Chess Club. Bryce Green and I are rejoined by the show's inspiration and co-host, David Talbot, author of several books, including The Devil's Chessboard, Alan Dulles, The CIA, and The Rise of America's Secret Government. And of course, Bryce is our man in Bloomington. Bryce Green, common contributor to uh, fairness and accuracy in reporting, and also a graduate student at Indiana University in Bloomington. In this episode, we're going to be talking about recent and upcoming articles from David Talbot and myself on the Kennedy assassinations, the media, and the CIA. We also have Noah Colwin joining us to talk about Blowback Season 4. This season of Blowback covers the U.S. empire in Afghanistan from the 1970s until now. We could say that the season of Blowback chronicles about 50 years of U.S. atrocities in that country. On the one hand, this is pretty grim stuff. On the other hand, I find something heartening about being able to talk about it in detail. It's easy to forget that that is something in and of itself. David and Bryce are going to join us on the other side here, so I'm going to end this brief intro with a movie trailer. The film series is called Four Died Trying. Created by John Kirby and Libby Handros, Four Died Trying offers a sweeping overview of the four major political assassinations in the 1960s. In the U.S. anyway, they were the four major ones. Through interviews with researchers, family members, and other people close to these events, the project seeks to educate and enlighten the public about who these slain leaders were, why they were killed, and why it still matters today for anyone who cares about peace, justice, and democracy. What kind of a peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana enforced on the world by American weapons of war. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on Earth worth living. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built. The bombs in Vietnam exploded home. They destroyed the dream and possibility for a decent America. Can I continue to deny and postpone the demands of our own people? while spending billions in the name of freedom elsewhere around the globe. The evidence clearly points to one man and one man alone, James Earl Ray. We just must not tolerate the sway of violent men. I am firmly convinced that Sirhan Sirhan, acting alone, killed Robert F. Kennedy. To the best of your knowledge, Chief, how many men were in on this conspiracy? I wasn't all of them, but at least two, you think. That's correct. An organized plot by sinister interests. Even now, the whole story has not been told. David Talbot, we're happy to have you here again. Happy to be here. And Bryce, it's, uh, I'm glad we're going to get this started now. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. And that trailer that we just saw is for the 
series of documentary films. It's a, not just a film series, but they're uh, planning on some multimedia things that I'm involved with, and David has been as well, uh, for this Four Died Trying series of documentary films on four American leaders who were gunned down in their primes uh, in the 1960s and how this changed American history. Uh, David, can you give us a rundown on your uh, what you know about this project and your, your history uh, with the project and what you've been doing with it? Because I, I have some high hopes for this, and I, I'm sure you do too. Yeah, thank you. And I'm, de I'm delighted it's coming out now. Yeah, the 60th anniversary of the JFK assassination. Uh, Four Dead Trying is going to premiere in November with uh, the Kennedy assassination. And the two filmmakers, Libby Hondros and John Kirby, I've known for some time. And uh, you're right, I was in the film, interviewed for the film. I'm also helping with the launch of the film in November. Um, it's very powerful, as you can see from the trailer. And uh, they try to say why these four men, these four great leaders of the 1960s, the Kennedy brothers, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, uh, made a difference. What they stood for, the values they were trying to, uh, you know, lead the country with, and uh, what their killings meant to this country. I think it tragically altered the history of the United States during my lifetime. As you know, I was a teenager then. I volunteered for Bobby Kennedy's campaign in 68 here in California. And, uh, you know, I don't think the country or I was ever the same after those four men were killed. I think it removed the heart and soul of this country. Yeah, I, I would agree with that based not on having lived through those years, but just after studying them for, you know, years and years and years. And uh, it did shift. It was a part of a shift that the U.S. never really recovered from. And even when you think of Eisenhower's administration and the way that it was influenced heavily by oil money and the Dulles brothers and so on, but even under Eisenhower... If you think of the Suez crisis and how you, the U.S. basically intervened on the side of Nasser, that's that shows that there was still some element of internationalism uh, le left over, in my opinion, not very much, but something from the New Deal era and the idea of a more benevolent kind of American leadership. And it seems like that those currents, Kennedy sort of took uh, picked up that mantle of, of just that strand of what was left of the New Deal and that kind of international ethos, and he tried to change foreign policy, and he gets overruled. And if there's any doubt as to what really happened, you just have to look at the trajectory of the U.S. after that. I mean, once Kennedy goes down, you have slaughter in Indonesia. You can't even comprehend. They put in a dictatorship in, in Brazil that warps and distorts the history of that country. You have um, the Congo. They basically put install... Lumumba's assassins to run that country for like 30 years. I mean, and they go into Vietnam. I mean, it's, it's the remarkable. The Dominican Republic uh, is invaded by Marines in 65 under Lyndon Johnson. One country after next that we intervened in. And you're right, that JFK as president knew that was tragic. As Senator from, uh, you know, Massachusetts when he was in his uh, in the 1950s, he spoke out against colonialism in Vietnam, in Algeria, uh, dignitaries from Africa who couldn't, by the way, in segregated Washington, D.C. in the 50s, stay anywhere, would come see him, and he would have to find housing for them, dignitaries from Africa in those years, in the 1950s. So Kennedy was ahead of his time in many ways. You know, in the new film Oppenheimer, which is a big hit this summer, he, uh, I didn't realize this, also intervened in the security clearance uh, hearings and the congressional hearings uh, that Oppenheimer was subjected to uh, in the 1950s uh, on the good side, on the right side, and inter intervened on behalf of Oppenheimer because he knew he'd been given a raw deal. So again, again, I think uh, John Kennedy was ahead of his time.
Right, and that initial, I mean, we didn't, even, you can go around the world, there's other things we didn't even, I didn't, like Israel, there's a huge shift. You go from Kennedy, who says like, no, you, you, we need inspections of your nuclear facilities, or we may consider even, you know, cutting off aid. That seems to uh, it spark the resignation of Ben-Gurion. And then you go from, so you go from that kind of an administration to one where the next president is basically doesn't even protest when Israel attacks and, and guns down, massacres basically American servicemen in the, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea during the Six Day War. I mean, I believe it was in the Mediterranean Sea, if not not the Red Sea. But I mean, that, that's a that's that's a, a, a change. The the coup in Greece. I mean, all these things that were so different, and that's just from JFK. You have Malcolm X goes down. What to, uh, shortly afterwards? That's the next one. What do you think is the significance of a democratic administration being the one, like under LBJ, the rest of these assassinations take place? What is the significance of that in terms of like thinking of the Democratic Party? I mean, they just stood by while they're, they're, they're top, the, the leading lights inside and even more to the radical side, obviously, with Malcolm X and MLK. But I mean, they did, they, they couldn't do it. They didn't do anything. Well, unfortunately, uh, I've been a Democrat all my life. And uh, that party, as Bobby Kennedy Jr. now says, has become the war party. Uh, you know, it's the Republicans who are speaking out against military uh, aid to Ukraine, um, who are going to stop that massive flow of weapons to Ukraine from the West, the U.S. Uh, that's continuing, uh, and we've talked about this, this grinding, terrible war with all the civilian casualties. It's the Democrats who are fomenting that war. Again and again, they are pushing for aggression around the world. And the Democrats, unfortunately, as Bobby Jr. said, have become the party of intervention, of aggression, again and again, against China, against Russia. Uh, you know, the military industrial complex in Wall Street owned the Democratic Party now. And that happened heavily, starting with Lyndon Johnson. But under Clinton, under Obama, unfortunately, and now under President Biden. So, yes, uh, again, again, my own party is on the wrong side. Uh, and Bobby Kennedy is trying to bring the country back to its party, rather, back to its original values. Values of peace, of diplomacy, of negotiation. And that's what JFK stood for in the, in the 60s before they killed him. I think the people, the wrong people, took control of this country after the assassination, and they've been in control ever since. You know, as a progressive or as a leftist, as you know, someone who studies American empire and is used to critiquing it, uh, you don't often see a, a difference between presidents in between administrations. You often see and you discuss American empire as you know, sort of a monolithic entity. And, you know, you, you look at some of the good things that presidents do, like, you know, Roosevelt gave us the New Deal. And, you know, we look at we look at some of the small gains and we are, we shrug them off because in the grand scheme of things, you know, the 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 empire keeps on churning no matter who's in the White House. And we're not used to looking closely at the administrations and looking at the the core differences between them. And uh, once you do, especially with the Kennedy administration, I mean, it becomes inevitable and it becomes uh, it becomes inevitable that someone starts to understand that the there was a dramatic shift in what happened in the core of the American you know regime, uh, not just the presidency, not just the, the Congress, but the actual distribution of power and uh, what the powerful people are willing to get away with. Uh, and I mean, you see that reflected in you know uh, polls of trust in government. I mean, you know, polls are polls, but the best gauge we have for understanding the sentiment of the American people. And right after 1963, 64, uh, you start seeing a steady decline in trust in American institutions. Uh, and that continues to this day. And that's, you know, paralleled by the increase of the power of the covert state, the increase of the power of entities and powers that are able to intervene in democracy uh, at will. Like, it's not like these didn't exist before. Um, but they were able to solidify their control over the, you know, the mechanisms of state power to the point where they were able to uh, enrich themselves at the expense of other people. And of course, people aren't stupid. They understand and see that. 
Uh, but, you know, as I said earlier, as, as a leftist, the uh, a leftist analysis of America can often miss that. It can often uh, just blend all these presidents together. And I was guilty of that until, you know, reading things like uh, Devil's Chessboard and uh, the other histories of the Kennedy years and seeing the things that like, uh, like you said, uh, anti-colonial sentiment, uh, speaking out against the war uh, or a potential war in Vietnam to his friends and uh, eventually trying to uh, get the U.S. out of that conflict. I mean, these sorts of nuances are lost when you uh, paint such a broad brush over American history. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I do think you have to look at each presidency and what the values and positions they took. And when you did the kind of nuanced research that I did for both brothers, my book, my earlier book, and Devil's Chessboard, and interviewed the people who surrounded the Kennedy brothers, who advised them, then it's a very different uh, situation. Uh, as you know, I interviewed all the living members of the Kennedy cabinet and circle before they died, McNamara, Sussinger, and so forth. And all of them confirmed this view of Kennedy, that he stood for peace, he stood for ending the Cold War, he stood for back-channel negotiations with uh, Moscow and Havana in those years. That's very threatening to the racket, as we described it last time, the racket of the military industrial complex, because they make money from blood and weapons of war and wars. They need to have a war. That's what produces their profits. And when he stood up and said no more, particularly in the nuclear age, this is very, very dangerous. Um, then he stood in their way. He had to be removed. And so that's, what they did. Right. And you wrote recently for the Kennedy Beacon. I think, uh, David, you and I are kind of on the same. I'm going to have a longer series of articles on this. And I've written the first one and I've submitted the second one. Now it's being edited on the media and uh, the media's complicity in this whole thing. And I'm try I try to take it back. The reason that mine is a series is that I, I'm and it may be more ambitious and who knows if it, how much people will want, will follow, but I hope that they do because I try to make it digestible. I'm pointing out how the the media, even before the creation of the CIA, played a very similar role w with selling the Cold War, uh, getting the U.S. into World War II the way they did, and then selling the 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 American century, which was really selling just selling the American century in the first place was a was a part of it, the idea, but it's really the Cold War that gives them the cover story, I think, for an empire. The, the American century part of it is half cover story, you know, half half truthful, because they are talking about making money and stuff. Uh, but then, you know, it's a, it's a PR man's pitch for it. It doesn't call itself empire. It's leadership and, you know, global freedom and we're advancing the whole world. But then the, that's not quite getting the job done. And so they, the Cold War, you have to actually organize around kind of an enemy. And then they've got perfect, the perfect situation for to gradually just put more top-down rule in, and the media is a huge part of that. Your, the, the title of your article is, Yes, Big Media, JFK and RFK Were the Victims of CIA Plots. And uh, you mentioned something in this article that we should discuss, which is the recent uh, articles in the New York Times and Vanity Fair, I think is the other one, uh, write-ups on this Secret Service agent who found a strange bullet in the, he claims, in the back of the, the limousine. And uh, this would seem to uh, falsify the magic bullet theory to the extent that it wasn't already. Uh, so tell us, tell us what your take is on this new, on this new development and this new strange story, which on the one hand, it's cool that the Times is like, we may have to rethink what happened in Dallas and how many shooters there are. On the other, if you're familiar with the case, it's a kind of an infuriating article. So uh, what, was, what, 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 do you, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think Paul Landis, the Secret Service agent, who found this nearly pristine bullet on the back uh, seat of the car, the limousine the president was riding in, was, is telling the truth as he sees it. He was a young guy at the time. He saw the president's head explode when the bullet hit it. He had to duck to uh, avoid the uh, fragments of, of JFK's skull and his brain matter. He was traumatized by this event, and he quit the Secret Service some months later. 
because he didn't want to embarrass the Secret Service, he said. He didn't want to break down. And it was a very traumatic event. It took him 60 years, but he finally revealed the story. I think it gives uh, the lie, finally. Puts to rest the magic bullet theory. This was the bullet, the supposedly pristine bullet, that went through President Kennedy and then went through Governor Connolly and emerged in nearly perfect condition afterwards. Arlen Specter, who later became senator from Pennsylvania, concocted this absurd theory. And for years, researchers knew it was crazy that a bullet can't possibly go through human bodies and inflict as much damage as it did on those two men and emerge in that condition. But this bullet did indeed hit Kennedy from behind and did not penetrate his back fully. It was an undercharged bullet. It didn't have enough gunpowder in it. So it only partially inflicted some damage on President Kennedy's back. That's in the Zapruder film, why he puts his arms up. He's hit in the back, but the bullet didn't go through him. It fell out. It fell out probably uh, on the uh, impact of the second bullet that exploded his head. So um, I think Paul Landis, the Secret Service man, is telling the story as he sees it truthfully at 88. He wants to get his conscience clear. I think this is amazing. The media reaction to it is amazing. Here's what I say. It took them 60 fucking years for the media to finally acknowledge the truth that we all know is true that Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy in Dallas by at least two, if not more, shooters, not Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, professional shooters who knew what they were doing. So the magic bullet theory on which the entire Warren Report is based is a lie, was concocted to fool the American people. And finally, it's been put to rest. The American media, finally, the mainstream media, has finally acknowledged this, the New York Times, as you said, <clears throat> and the Vanity Fair, and it's gone everywhere across the world because the New York Times is a tale that wags the rest of the media industry. It's gone to every uh, outlet you can think of. And Paul Landis has been on CNN, he's done TV interviews, it's everywhere. So I think the cat is out of the bag, the magic bullet theory is dead, the Warren Report is dead, that there is a conspiracy. There's at least one other shooter we know involved in this crime. And so the media should do its job now. Who was the second shooter? Who really killed President Kennedy? What was the motivation for them? And I interviewed Ben Bradley, who's a legend, head of the Washington Post, Kennedy's best friend in the uh, Washington press corps. At the time, he was at Newsweek. He was head of the Washington Bureau. I interviewed Don Hewitt, the creator of 60 Minutes, uh, also produced the uh, famous Nixon-Kennedy debates in 1960 on TV. Both men knew there was a conspiracy. It was obvious to them. Knew that the CIA was probably involved, if not the mafia and Cuban exiles as well, underneath the CIA that orchestrated. They knew that Alan Dulles, who was a former CIA director, played a big role in this, that he was not only in orchestrating a crime, but the cover-up, because he got himself appointed to the Warren Commission afterwards. And some people thought he was so active that should have been called the Dulles Commission. Uh, so they knew there was a rat uh, and, and uh, a body that was stinking up the House of Democracy. But both men put their careers uh, ahead of solving the epic crimes. They could have done it at the Washington Post. They could have done it at 60 Minutes, two of the leading investigative uh, press institutions in this country. They chose not to, and Ben Bradley told me because he put his own career first. That's why. He put, threw his best friend in the White House under the bus, and he threw democracy under the bus by not doing this. This is an outrage to me. So yes, the media finally covering the story, Paul Landis, the magic bullet is dead. I applaud them for doing what's obvious, but now they should do their fucking job and investigate the crime. Yeah, I mean, I, I what you're saying about an underpowered bullet, that's the first time that it actually, 
it, that makes me think of it a little differently than I had been because to me that seems kind of preposterous. But I, I that is that seems possible. They did have somebody probes the wound in the autopsy, and then he's told to stop. Is my understanding of that back wound, and so they never trace the trajectories or probe them with rods like they do typically in a gunshot victim, and so on. It was small enough. They probed it with uh, their pinky finger. Yeah. So yeah. not uh, a full penetration of President Kennedy's back. I mean, if so, that's that's fascinating. If so, because it does. My understanding was that the ballistics did match the magic bullet, or, or did you know the CE three ninety nine? Like that does seem to have been fired out of the Manlicker Carcano, but the condition of the bullet matches pretty closely what they got when they tested it by firing uh, bullets from that man liquor Carcano into a, a, a bag of cotton wadding that was like really compressed and then it would stop, but it wouldn't really damage it, but everything else sort of shattered it. So that actually thinking of it that way makes it seem like, well, maybe that actually was the bullet and then somehow it ends up on this other stretcher or something, but it also, well, to my mind. And, and the man liquor was a World War II era weapon used yeah, by the Italian army. And they were known to have undercharged bullets often uh, in these World War II era weapons. So they were trying to pin this on Lee Harvey Oswald, who supposedly was uh, firing the gun. And so it's quite conceivable that this bullet was indeed undercharged and only penetrated uh, President Kennedy's back partly. So that's why that rings true to me. And, and they could have mm. given somebody they could have had one of the shooters with that man like or Carcano just in order to be able to use that as the murder weapon. Cause you, that isn't the weapon you'd use for when you're actually thinking, Hey, we need to kill this guy. It was the one that they nicknamed the humanitarian rifle because yes. of it was not very good. And we know that the Italians, they're, they're good at sports cars and suits and shoes. They can make those, but they're not known for their warfare prowess in the 20th, 20th century. I knew someone in the Italian military who was trained on that weapon and talked about how faulty uh, a <laughs> gun was and how often misfired. So, uh, and I've handled the man liquor. I, I know the bolt action uh, is quite, takes a lot of time. There's no way that he could have got off three expert shots from the rear using that gun. Uh, and it's been virtually impossible for experts to replicate that feat with that gun. So, uh, President Kennedy's head was blown off by a professional assassin uh, from a different direction, from probably the grassy knoll area. So we know that, and uh, that was quite an amazing feat, uh, that shot. Actually, not a huge feat when you're down there in Dallas and Dealey Plaza. You see how small an area it is. But the car was moving slightly. It took a professional, and that's, I believe, it was that the gun was fired from a different direction, not the man liquor. But this wound, the magic bullet, was caused probably by the man liquor, and uh, the, the, the bullet dropped out of the president's back. And that's what Paul Landis, the Secret Service agent. Yeah. Now, here's, here's what to me is, is more fascinating than. Uh, or, or more, I, I, I want to ponder it more than the actual details of the of what they go over in the article, because to me, the, there's so much about the ballistics that you already can, and the forensics of the whole case that you can more or less, you, there's some things you don't know and you can't know and you whatever, you got to move on at some point. But in terms of what we do know and the way that they wrote this article, okay, you're, it, it's not as if anything that this guy says is suddenly so much more conclusive than the testimony of people like, Clint Hill himself, who is mentioned in the article, but they don't mention the fact that his account basically falsifies the Warren Commission as well of a massive exit wound to the back of Kennedy's head. Additionally, Connolly is in the car and his account more or less falsifies it. And it's backed up by the film because he says he hears the first shot. The president's been hit. He's holding his neck. He turns one direction. He turns the other and then he gets shot. And that's actually seems to be borne out by the video because he's holding that hat in his in the wrist that would get later get shattered so that what so what what i'm getting at is what why does the times not just ignore this book like it ignores the others is there something is this something to do with the 60th anniversary coming up is it something I, to do with the stories of carlson or what i think that's a billion dollar question why is the media now deciding to abandon the warren report i think that's very important I think it's the same question we have at President Biden now. 
why is David Ignatius at the Washington Post, who's a voice of the political establishment and basically of U.S. intelligence, why is he abandoning President Biden? So he's saying he's too old now to run for president. Uh, so, what, yes, it's our job to question the corporate media, to understand why they decide to pivot. Uh, and they are pivoting now. It's huge act for the New York Times, twice, I think, within two months, Peter Baker, who's a White House correspondent for the New York Times, and you don't get any more New York Times than Peter Baker, to question the Warren Report. He wrote a story a couple of months ago based on Jefferson Morley, my friend's revelation, and Jeff has studied this uh, uh, crime for years now, that uh, Oswald's mail, who and they said Oswald was on the CIA's radar screen, the CIA, uh, CIA claimed, but they opened his mail in the months before Dallas and reading it. And then this, Paul Landa Secret Service uh, Magic Bullet uh, revelations, the second story of the New York Times, has done. So yes, they decided the Warren Report is finally a crock <laughs> and they have to abandon it. But will they take the next step and then say who really killed JFK and why? That's the next question that's looming for the American media. I think a lot of our ills flow from this crime and cover up, as you know. And I think that it's a way back to uh, to the America that we all espouse, we all believe in. The America of freedom, of justice, of peace. Uh, I think the wrong people are running this country, the war machine, Wall Street. They're doing it for their own profits, as Bobby Kennedy said. They invade the uh, earth, the environment, our bodies, uh, other countries. It's time for us to finally stand up and say, enough. This is not the country we want. This is not the country we want to leave for our children. This is a country of death and pollution and greed. And we don't want this country. Yeah, I mean, it's harming us and it's and that's not even harming us as much as it's harmed the rest of the world. Pretty much every region you go down and you see what America, what the U.S. has done. And it's just been a, the Cold War is really just a cover story for global counter revolution. And uh, it, it's it, it, we and it never stopped even after the fact that it continued after the Cold War that the Soviet Union fell just shows that it was never really about that. It was about the same things that empires are always about. But to my mind, like what's significant about this, and I, I've said this for quite a while now, is that as this empire starts to like crumble, in my opinion, someone who tries to understand what, what the American deep state or establishment or empire, what the pinnacle of it, the way that they think and what they, what they are aiming for and what their methods are, to my mind, since this empire has basically run its course, the U.S. would, it, it would be in their enlightened self-interest to find a way to redirect this ship that they have steered so long. And I, I don't, I, I've said this before, that perhaps some revelation of spectacular state crime and then a, a, a would would be the way for the elites to actually begin a process because th this is such such a top-down system that there's going to have to be some buy-in from elites because they can they can not just kill us all they can kill the whole world they have the nuclear arsenal i mean they're this is a very powerful and dangerous machine but i think it's in their interest if they recognize it or if at least enough of them do that there needs that they, these things that they've been suppressing so vigilantly for so many decades that to let these things be exposed could take on a momentum to like sort of a, a, a affect a really positive change and move in the direction of democracy. And then you can start to actually debate things and, and move operate in a, in a sort of democratic way. So I, I, I wonder if this is an indication that there are some people somewhere high up who might ha agree with me or at least think let's, try to lay some groundwork so that we might be able to take this option and it doesn't seem totally out of the blue. I don't know. It's fascinating, though. Well, well I think Trump was the beginning of the end. Uh, Trump, in his corrupt, demagogic, uh, below hard way, I think was saying the system, as you know it, is over. The Republican Party was taken over by Trump and they can indict him as much as they want, and they can prosecute him, but he's still their guy. 
<laughs> he's still going to be the Republican nominee. And now they're really afraid, they being the establishment that runs this country, uh, that Biden is toast. He's too old to run. He can't debate Trump. So they want to get rid of him. I think Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, is their go-to guy. I think he's uh, you know, eager to step in at this point. And I think we're going to have a race in this country between uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. and Gavin Newsom for the Democratic nomination and against Trump uh, as Republicans stand to bear. Uh, that, to me, the fact that the system is that kind of cockeyed at this point uh, means that the system of control is starting to fall apart. And for the Times to finally admit that Kennedy was probably killed by a conspiracy is a huge uh, change of events, I think. Um, I think they're in disarray. I think they don't know what the future is. I think they're panicked. They're full of fear about the future. They're full of fear that we know more than they do, that fake news is no longer, uh, you know, putting us to sleep, that uh, Trump was the beginning in his kind of crazy way that the system doesn't work anymore. And it's up to people like us to really, I think, take a leadership role and expose the truth and tell people what's right. And uh, they don't know what to believe at this point. I think from the Kennedy assassination to who should run the country, uh, to should we intervene in Ukraine, it's all up for grabs now. It's all up for discussion. And, and we should, people like us, independent people, thinking people, should put our own ideas forward. Lawful people would... <laughs> I mean, yeah, awful. people who don't exist in the state of exception uh, or you know you can do whatever you want and you know that there's going to be no consequence uh well one of those organizations that does that is you know the the dnc which you know bobby kennedy for all his talk about you know uh, overturning the system he did decide to run as a democrat and not an independent and not a republican even though uh you know the republican primary uh, even though they're a bunch of crazies over there uh they are their process is definitely more democratic than the ironically than the democratic party uh, and it's a process that we know has been rigged in the past we've seen it with bernie sanders uh so uh, the question is like why would rfk jr decide to run as a democrat i've, I've seen him answer that question before by saying uh you know because he's a lifelong democrat uh, but in terms of affecting change, uh, wouldn't it make sense to run outside of that system? Wouldn't it make sense to, you know, not run in a rigged system? He recently wrote an open letter to the DNC talking about uh, uh, how rigged, you know, the, their entire operation is. So, so wh why do that? Why stay there? And uh, wh why wouldn't he do something on the outside? Uh, well, I think that's a really good question, Bryce, and one that we're all trying to figure out. I think Bobby Kennedy Jr.'s, you're right, his, his loyalty and attachment to that party is a very deep one and goes back to his family roots. And it would be, I think, disloyal of him, he would feel, if he were to run against the Democratic Party outside of the Democrats because of the legacy of his father and his uncle and so forth. So that'd be a heavy emotional thing for him to break away from that party, given his roots. But I begun to look, see some clues that he might be willing to do that in a general election. If they rig uh, the nomination, if they give a hand to someone like Gavin Newsom, if Biden drops out, and I think Bobby Kennedy might run at that point as an independent in the general election. Let's wait and see. Um, I'm beginning to, as I said earlier, look, I'm a lifelong Democrat too. It's hard for me to see you know, voting for someone outside the party, outside the system. But I do think that the DNC has become so corrupt. And I saw this, like you said, Bryce, with Bernie and now I'm seeing it again, this movie, 
uh, with Bobby Kenny Jr. How corrupt, how owned it is by uh, the, the powers that be, by Wall Street, by the military contractors who it's pour billions of dollars into the party. Yeah. They own yeah, the party. If you look at the polls, uh, you know, the, you look at the Republican candidates and they're polling at like in the single digits. Uh, they're, they're getting almost no recognition. But, you know, they're all given uh, space on the, you know, the Republican platforms. They're getting space on Fox News and all all these right leaning outlets. But then you turn to the Democratic primary process. And then you have I think the last time I checked, it was Marion Williamson at uh, like five percent. And like Bobby Kennedy at like 15, 18 or something like that. Uh, and Biden with, you know, uh, something like 60 something. Why aren't Marion Williamson and Bobby Kennedy getting uh, getting play? I mean, it's just it's just like you say, it's just so, so well, completely naked. Well, they are getting play, but you know, Bobby Kennedy is on Fox News. I mean, yeah. go figure. He's more popular outside of the party. It's That's the, the weirdest party. thing. Mm hmm. I've never seen this before. A guy who would like be better in the general than he is in the primary. Although I guess Bernie was a little bit like that. If you, but with RFK, it's even more. The only people that like trust the media are uh, the the corporate media that that is anti RFK Jr. all the time. Pretty much, the only people that trust the corporate media are Democrats. I mean, not yeah. all Democrats, but like basically Democrats. They're the ones who are like fake news and like when the Washington Post writes, "Democracy dies in darkness." They, the only people who would even believe that for a second are, are in the Democratic Party. I think uh, it's. Yeah. If you look so, at the Gallup poll that shows trust in media, you know you see this uh, largely downward trend for you know all of eternity. Uh, but if you look at the partisan divide, um, independents and Republicans they keep that downward trend. But in 2016, uh, Democrats their trust in mainstream media is shot dramatically upward. It's hovering somewhere around like 70, 75 percent. Whereas Republicans are somewhere like like seven or like ten percent or something like that, and that's it seems to be why uh, these places like the you know MSNBC, CNN, uh, Democrats seem to look at those outlets and uh, see them as a, a true voice of truth, uh, but the rest of the country doesn't see see it that way, which is a stark divide. Yeah, when I was young, you know, it was the Democrats who spoke out against the war in Vietnam who wanted to cut off funding for that war. And now we have them moving all, like you say, in, in lockstep. No one has challenged, uh, you know, President Biden. No elected official has in the Democratic Party. That's bizarre to me, given how weak he is in the polls, how old he is. It's ridiculous that no one has come forward to challenge him. Uh, that shows the, the conformity in the Democratic Party and how... Uh, basically uh, weak those leaders are. So again, Bobby Kennedy, given all the physical and security problems and risks that he's taking, to me is a hero for doing that, for doing what, you know, all the other elected officials who want to aspire to the White House should be doing now. They're not. They're waiting for Biden to drop out and then they'll jump in. To me, that's, you know, weakness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I I I pay attention to national politics and of course I think it's important. Uh but I've been pretty, you know, uh, agnostic about, you know, getting too invested in the presidential campaign uh just because I see the whole system as uh kind of a losing game, right? Like I don't expect uh that Bobby Kennedy will get a fair play. I don't expect that Cornell West will get a fair play or Marion Wilson or or anyone else for that matter. Uh and you know, honestly, I think that some uh, leftists, some progressives, uh, they're struggling to figure out what precisely they can do in this moment. They look at, you know, uh, the national politics. They see it as uh, completely corrupt. What would your advice be for someone to uh, how they can help this anti-imperialist movement or this moment uh, from a local standpoint? Like, you know, you've been in this world for a long time. You've been in this space uh, so what would you what would you say to them? What would you say to that uh, that critique of this national politics focus? You know, Bryce, I'm with you. I think it could be uh, fuel, <laughs> to tell you the truth. I think uh, presidential politics, this kind of leadership of the country desperately needs 
is uh, beyond what we can do as a people. When Bobby Kennedy was on C-SPAN two days ago, he said he's 10 times more threatening to the powers that be in this country than Bernie Sanders was. I think he's right. Yeah. I think he's challenging a big pharma of the military industrial complex of Wall Street, of Blackstone. The people are buying up all the houses in this country. They're taking control, as uh, Aaron has said, of the housing market. He speaks against all that. He was the, the, one of the primary environmental lawyers. He speaks out against the way that they have destroyed our nature, the air and the water that we breathe and, and rely on and drink. So yes, in some ways, I think it's out of our hands. These people are too powerful. They're too armed. <laughs> They're too violent. They're too greedy. But I do Thank think- Thank you for the but. There's a happy side. There's a happy <laughs> side. <laughs> Despite all that, I do. I have children. I believe in the future. And I'm willing to fight. And if I, at my right old age, <laughs> willing to fight, then a lot of others are too to take back this country and i do agree with you aaron that in a general election someone who like bobby kennedy who's not afraid to speak the truth as he sees it and talks very intelligently and listens to people and is not scripted and is feels like authentic person you know he was 14 when his own dad was killed he talks very honestly about his addiction uh, to heroin and other drugs for almost 10 years when he was younger. Um, someone who's like that, someone who as intelligent as he is and speaks the truth and as brave as he is, is what this country desperately needs. So all of us support him for that reason. And yeah, when really. he makes mistakes, I tell Bobby, I, you know, sometimes I email him, you know, he's running a presidential campaign with this, like all leaders, he has this frantic time right now. He does make some mistakes, but he's a good man. I know him. I've known him for a long time. Uh, I know his heart and I know how brave he is. That's what, that's what strikes me too. And this is where I, I won't say I'm, I'm, I'm kind of past being wanting to be really angry at people on the left, but I will say that I'm a bit disappointed in them for not the fact. I'm that not mad, left, just disappointed. <laughs> the fact that the left cannot solve the '60s assassinations, you know, many of them, I, I find that embarrassing and pitiful. Yeah. I find it pathetic, to be honest. I find it pathetic that they cannot realize that this this bourgeois state, this empire that they supposedly oppose so much. They just, oh, they can't think that they would possibly do something like that. Okay, the fact that that ideal holds sway here, and because of that, you don't have to really acknowledge that what Robert Kennedy is doing is really risking a very comfortable life with all kinds of comforts in order to do the same thing, to try to do what his dad was killed trying to do. I, I don't, it, it really is uh, disturbing to me that the people on the, the people not on the left in the U.S., have not embraced this camp, his candidacy more, but I guess you shouldn't be surprised that uh, the, they assassinated the Kennedys and then they pay people like Seymour Hersh a million bucks to, to assassinate Kennedy posthumously, you know, with his books. And, and these are the ones that get the good reviews and your bro book brothers, uh, the times review wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't very good. If I remember correctly, right. They did review it, but they weren't as, you know, they, they were dismissive to, to a degree and they didn't, they ignored devil's chessboard. So these other things they ignore, but then they'll say, oh, Vincent Bugliosi and Gerald Posner's book are, are amazing. <laughs> I mean, this is, we've never dealt with this. And it's like the, the consequences of not really dealing with this and having this fake idea of history, we're seeing that we're seeing it now that they don't even really recognize this. And, uh, you know, Bobby is a realist. So I think he's going to take some positions that are not going to be popular with people or that I would disagree with totally. But I'm not even wanting to like, at this point, I'm not really interested in discussing the details of like thing, you know, some of these controversial political issues because you can pretty much figure out the, the reality in a moral sense, but like the real, the reality of the political situation and how he's trying to formulate something that is like going to appeal to a big enough 
group of coalition of people that he might be able to be elected and make some serious changes. And I don't know that people, that I think a lot of people want to pretend that that's not what he's doing, that he's running for some other screwball reason or something else. This has been a little, this has been disappointing to me, but politics is all about disappointment. It's kind of like sports in that way, uh, especially <laughs> in America. It's all very disappointing, the, the politics. You know, I've been a person of the left my whole life. Uh, I got kicked out of military school during the Vietnam era, and uh, I've questioned authority from the left uh, ever since. And at Mother Jones magazine, at Salon, which I founded, and in my books. But I don't think it is left and right anymore. I think we're beyond that, those, uh, those categories at this point. Uh, I believed in them my whole life, but now I think that's come apart. We have the true people, People are for the truth, who understand what's happening to this country, what's being done in this country, and we have those who cover it up. And that's what I think the great divide now in American politics. Those who are brave enough to face the truth, who confront the truth, and say they want the truth, and those who deny it and cover it up. And the Democrats, too often, the people run the Democratic Party, fall into the latter category the people who deny the truth, who cover it up. And I don't want to be on that side anymore. So I'm for any leader at this point who crosses over and tells the truth. And Bobby Kennedy Jr. does. So, um, you know, if he runs in the general election, not as a Democrat, I would continue to support him uh, against whoever the Democratic nominee is. Because that Democratic nominee, if it's not Bobby, will say sweet words, great words, and just like Obama, and just like Obama, uh, Biden rather, sell us out. And I don't really sold out my age anymore. I want someone yeah. who speaks the truth. Well, this uh, this issue of top if, if, of, le of whether left versus right is relevant is actually something that I've been sort of fixated upon lately, but it's too deep to get into now. We've gone a little bit longer than we plan to anyway, because yeah. we have this excellent interview with Noah Cullen coming up. So I'm going to leave it at that, but we will revisit that issue of left versus right, because I do, I, I partly, in large part, I agree that the, the normal versions of left, right are not important, but the reason I see it as being not important is that it's, the left is no longer just opposed to top down. And that's where I think the left went wrong a little bit. Uh, really, the issue now is top down. And do we want this kind of top down despotism or not? And that can unite a lot of people even more than left versus right. And you can't even really debate left and right when you're under a system of top down despotism. So but we're more on that. Uh, at, a, at a future episode, <laughs> well, especially when the terms of left and right have been so distorted to the point where you know, even talking about the Kennedy assassination, some people describe that, you know, as a right wing conspiracy theory. Uh, and, you know, yeah. talking about uh, you mean uh, saying uh, that the state did it is a right wing. Thing. Yes. Say, saying yeah, the yeah. state did it or, you know, talking about it in a serious way yeah. is considered a right wing conspiracy theory. And, you know, criticizing pharmaceutical companies is a right wing, yeah. uh, a right wing talking point. And, and then you have things like uh, uh, trying to get people, uh, uh, you know, fired from their from their jobs for uh you know speaking out against uh, ridiculous state and corporate power uh you, you can call that a left-wing position now uh yeah. so it's it's just all it's all topsy-turvy and uh while i do consider myself a leftist and i am rooted in uh, you know those those traditions uh of of martin luther king uh you know of the the progressive era of the labor unions uh the terms left and right as they're used in contemporary political discourse have uh, their utility is questionable, to say the least, these days. That's right. I agree with you, Bryce. I agree with both of you. All right. David Talbot, thank you very much for joining us. And we're going to move on to our interview with Noah Colwin next. So it was great to All have right, you, guys. and we'll uh, talk to you again yeah. soon. All right. Thank you. Noah Colwin, thank you so much for joining Devil's Chess Club today. Thanks for having me. So you have produced now four seasons, the fourth one you just released, just in time for that special season of the year uh, around September, around the September 11th anniversary. You get it out a few weeks beforehand. Uh, what made you decide to cover Afghanistan uh, it, it now here in 2023? This is a big undertaking for you. So it's an impressive series. What made you decide to go with this subject? So 
our first season, you know, in doing like a history podcast, uh, you know, Iraq was an interesting and kind of obvious place to start, an easy uh, single event for people to understand. The next one, um, Cuban Revolution, and, and then the one after that, the Korean War, you know, these episodes of Cold War history that are not really well understood by Americans, and there's kind of intuitive, but, you know, deeper in the past. Uh, and, and, and then we got to Afghanistan. And we got to thinking, you know, or we got to or rather we got to the fourth season. We got to thinking like, well, what's something more recent? And the bungled withdrawal uh, was very fresh in our memory. And moreover, the complete, uh, you know, sort of, um, you know, this is similar to what had happened with the Iraq war in our first season, just like the memory holding of Afghanistan as a war, which was 20 years long, uh, was also pretty crazy. And, you know, and then you sort of glance at the Afghanistan story in many respects. And it just sort of, it's, it's very, uh, it's a very natural fit because of course the Afghanistan war didn't really start in 2001. It, it didn't even start in, in, in the 1990s. It started in the 1980s and in the seventies actually. And I think that there was a sort of like, all right, well here, here we've identified some facts and some ideas about and preconce and some, um, uh, perspective about how the you know the crisis and the tragedy of afghanistan has unfolded that is you know fairly different from the mainstream perspective and and just sort of beginning to tell a story um out of the divergence between between the reality and that myth yes bryce and i are actually going to do a review my first ever attempt at reviewing a podcast series uh which is i think interesting because i just you know i i think it speaks to how much uh i think of your work in general like it's really cool what you guys are doing with the medium but uh i want to point out one of the this is early in the afghanistan history and uh we're going to talk about this a bit i think when we do the review but i, I figure while you're here this is a good one to ask you about the beginning of um, U.S. involvement in the coup, uh, one thing I think that you guys explained really well, better than I had heard it before, and I'd, I'd heard parts of this story from people like Gould and Fitzgerald, because I was listening to these on podcasts and interviews and things for years before uh, I, I'd even started to write about this, but I, and I found this fascinating, but it was always really confusing, and I never delved into this aspect of it that much and then adam curtis has his own kind of bullshit version of it which i think confused me even more which i think is adam curtis's job but you guys explain it really well and i think to my mind you the implicate what you leave as an implication to me i think you've established as as likely the truth and that is that amin was a cia asset even though he was a super communist also, yeah, on, uh, apparently he's a super communist, but <laughs> this to me is so nefarious. And it's like <clears throat> the fact that I, even though I've researched this stuff a lot, the fact that I didn't really look that much into this particular aspect of it, I looked at more of like what Brzezinski and Gates wrote about it after the fact. But can you explain like how you, how, how you, you focused on him and then what the significance of this guy is? Cause it is, a, it is wild. Sure. So Hafizul Amin was the leader of Afghanistan. He was the leader of the Afghan communists that took over in a mid nineteen late nineteen seventies revolution, and it was a it was an unexpected revolution. He the Soviet Union did not particularly support the Afghan Communist Party. They didn't think of them as as a particularly a, as a bunch of winners. So when they succeeded in deposing the sort of previous. Um, you know, autocrat, um, a guy named Daoud, uh, and this guy, Amin, sort of, he was the, the bloodiest of the communists, of the Afghan communists. He rose to the top, and Amin was also a, he had previously studied in America. He had been a, uh, he had been a student at Columbia University, and he'd been president of the Afghan Students Association. And in the late 1960s, Ramparts Magazine, which revealed the fact that the National Student Association, which was a kind of controlled opposition student group that had been, that it revealed that basically all of the NSA's money had come from the CIA. And, and, this, Af and this Afghan Student Association revelation was like literally a guy who had been at UC Berkeley 
telling, you know, writing in Ramparts about his experience of being recruited, like an Afghan student in in America, of it writing about his experience of being recruited by the government to run to run this group or to be a part of it. And so, you know, it's 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 extremely, extremely strong evidence that I mean, you know, just going on that alone before any of the stuff that comes up in the 70s, that well, if he was the president of this group that we know, you know, another guy says was being run as a CIA uh, cutout that like, I mean, had a relationship of some kind with the CIA. Um, fast there's forward, a direct fast, Brzezinski connection, right? Well, the, he the, so Brzezinski was at Columbia, and I mean, um, had also been at Columbia. And I think, you know, there's there's some overlap. I think it's also it's 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 more I don't know if that there was a specific connection between the two. I think it, it definitely a minimum, you can say it speaks to the spookiness of Columbia University. Um, oh, yeah, that's the one that well, no, that they were they're a big Rockefeller school. I mean, I think J Beard was it after World War One. This was like kind of scandalous, like uh, there were it was controversial the way that they were so. Yeah, I mean, I think for... pretty much any like university probably has skeletons like that. Yeah. Um, and it's Columbia like the, is Columbia is, and is, Chicago is... are the most Rockefeller associated with Rockefellers. My yeah, I mean, Columbia is now just like the worst landlord in New York, that kind of thing. But uh, anyway, so they um um. They, I mean, in, in Afghanistan, he is, you know, he's leader of the country. He comes from a faction that is numerically superior within, like, the among the Afghan communists called Khalq. And they are the sort of more um, provincial, uh, rad like, rural radicals. And Parcham, the, the other faction, is, you know, more moderate, so to speak. And Amin basically is like he's you know like ramping up the executions the soviet union and he's been asking for soviet troops to come in you know for for a while and the soviets say you know like they, they begin to say all right all right all right all right like we've got to take stock here we've actually we've just got to kill this guy and stabilize it and then get out and amin you know there's some reports that he had uh he was a pashtun and uh, there, you know, uh, Elizabeth Gould and Paul Fitzgerald have reported that he had made contact uh, or had been in contact um, with Golbadin Hekmatyar, who was a kinsman of his and who was soon to become an American financed warlord. But the sort of, you know, the, the, the I think the most relevant detail is that um, based on a testimony from a Soviet from a Soviet military official that we had translated uh, by a friend of our show, by a friend of the show, we he he says that he makes it clear that regardless of what you know we think now you know uh 50 years later about whether or not amin was acting under the influence of the cia in the late 1970s which you know the circumstances there's 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 some strong evidence supporting that the soviets believed it they took it they took it that that's that is what they contended would be the reality and i don't think that they were off base you know to to think that based on how Amin had been sort of like rapid, you know, he had, I mean, he'd just been like shooting his opponents and and against the, against the Council of the Soviet Union and had, uh, you know, killed his uh, any potential rival for power. Um, you know, it was the it was it was not a situation that the Soviet Union necessarily wanted to, you know, perpetuate in their sphere of influence. So I think that there is again, like it's a it's hard with these kinds of things, right? To, you know, because they are by their nature, these sorts of things like, you know, cultivating um, a CIA asset in the, as a student in the 60s. Uh, it's not exactly something that, you know, they're going to make very obvious was the case years later. However, like we have some really interesting and persuasive facts that indicate that like, yeah, Amin was like, I mean, I mean, stank like a Langley motherfucker. Absolutely, he did. And the Columbia thing is also pregnant with implication. I mean, that isn't a place that you, if you are, go to Columbia and you're active in, you know, student life and so on, there's not really a Columbia University to radical communist revolutionary pipeline that I've ever heard of. Uh, and yet there you were uh, with him back in Afghanistan after that fact. Brzezinski is there at Columbia as well, and he factors in your story as well as he should. So how how to what extent can Brzezinski be seen as the mastermind of this uh, strategy to uh, to trap the Soviets? 
Uh, Brzezinski deserves a lot more credit than he he gets, uh, is how I'd put it. By, like, by credit, it, you mean blame. Yes, exactly. Better, <laughs> yeah, bingo. Like he he is he is the um, he essentially during the Carter years and as sort of like a you know this this can be kind of classified as like the post Watergate period, and there was a kind of sense of um, you know like uh, you know. Qu- it was a, the doldrums of the Cold War, as far as, you know, a lot of America's Cold Warriors were concerned. There wasn't really, a, you know, there, after the Nixon detente, which they really didn't like, there wasn't really, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot doing. And Brzezinski, he, you know, I don't think that he was, uh, he necessarily had as much capacity to do as much damage as he would have, li- as, uh, as he would have liked, because he was actually quite hardline. But... He did take very seriously the covert operations that would later, you know, emerge and, and sort of bl- blossom more fully in under the Reagan administration. But as Carter's national security advisor, he made quite sure that the Mujahideen were, uh, you know, doing everything that they could to destabilize the Afghan government. And, you know, if we, it, you know, it, it's, it's called an Afghan trap for a reason and Brzezinski despite what he would you know later say about trying to say no no I never said that that's not my position uh it's pretty clear with hindsight that the Carter NSC under Brzezinski was really kind of dreaming up ways to try and make the Soviets go in by weakening Afghanistan by turning it into a, a basket case and I mean you know essentially uh, from the American perspective, giving them an opportunity to, over the course of the 1980s, ramp up the Afghan, you know, rebellion, essentially, into, uh, you know, a, a, a way to try and give the Soviet Union an American Vietnam, or their own Vietnam, rather. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, to what that... ex- uh, oh, I was going to ask, to, to what extent is, uh, did Brzezinski originate this idea versus uh, whether or not it emerged out of the, you know, the Safari Club milieu that you talk about. You know, you mentioned that uh, when Charlie Wilson was doing his thing and uh, going around and going to all these parties and ginning up support, uh, one of the major or part of the major milieu that he tapped in was this Safari Club network of, you know, people, uh, intelligence officials and intelligence connected people from around the world and all of these places. So to what extent is this policy originate in the United States uh, with Brzezinski and the NSC uh, versus to what extent was it uh, just a consensus of all these people around that area of the Pakistanis, the Saudis, the uh, and, and the Chinese even? Yeah, so it's a good question. I think the uh, I think that the um, you could say that the policy was kind of uh, incubated initially under Rosinski in the 70s because it was part of this broader effort to you know create groups like the safari club or to make associations like those where the work that would previous or the you know the where basically the kinds of um covert ops that would previously happen under the purview of the direct purview of the americans would now be subcontracted to lesser allies and i would argue that like you know part of this isn't such a neat timeline because Afghanistan doesn't happen in isolation because in 1979, the Shah falls. And that means that one of the, you know, the, the biggest military pillar of the American presence in the region is now gone. And the Saudis, they can't like they're they're about to get, you know, pumped through with even more military money than they were getting before. But they did not have the capacity to project power as a regional hegemon and Iraq was you know the like like iraq was under saddam hussein um it was not necessarily considered friendly to u.s interests certainly not to israel which was a big problem for america and so the way that these problems resolved right is that well iraq starts to go to war with iraq in uh, sorry iraq goes to war with iran in 1982 which makes it or yeah late 81 82 and it makes it a lot easier for um you know, like that kind of takes one piece off the board. And I think, I think it was actually under Carter because the the what Robert Perry wrote is that Cyrus Vance gave a green light to Saddam, which would have meant it was. Yes, 1980 yes, yeah, or, exactly. It, yes, precisely. It was it was a um, it was like absolutely, you know, because this is also like Carter's people are 
you know, they're on the back foot trying, you know, they're, they're, they're basically getting more extreme in their reactions, the later in the presidency they get, um, as their political problems mount from the hostage crisis and so on. And, uh, as it relates to Afghanistan, the, and, the, and, and you know, where this idea comes from, I think the, the really big domino to kind of fall is basically, uh, or rather the, 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 the big change in the environment is the arrival of general Zia. Because basically, once the Americans have a friendly political leader in in regime in Pakistan, um, Afghanistan becomes much more interesting for them in terms of the scale of what they're able to accomplish. Um, because the Pakistani government is is you know, of all the warlords in their in their in in that region, like the Pakistani military is the largest group, uh, and it became a tremendous you know they became a tremendous asset. Uh, and, you know, this was all done hand in glove in, in a lot of ways with Saudi intelligence, because a lot of our relationships with the, you know, especially with Pakistan are, if not mediated by the Gulf states, like they have a lot to do with it. Um, and we sort of during this period began working hand in glove. So I think that the idea for how to do it definitely came up in the Carter years. But it's really only in the early 1980s that like, you know, once you have the kind of like rails on which a policy is going to start happening kind of gets set then, you know, and Casey and Bill Casey gets put in charge, then stuff goes off to the races. And, you know, you see, and Charlie Wilson gets into it. Like you start to see the numbers and the allocations just go up and up and up and up and it skyrockets, you know, you're from the seventies. It's like couch cushion change compared to what it is by like 84, 85. And that's before the stingers ever get there. Right. How did Reagan, I mean, Carter's doing this under Brzezinski. I'd, I'd take, I, I, when we did a whole lot of research on this, uh, when we were doing those articles with Peter Del Scott and Ben Howard and I, and uh, we, we found that, uh, look, looking back, Brzezinski is, even before Carter, Brzezinski is working in this vein. He's, there's a cover of Time Magazine about like the arc of crisis, which I think is more early 70s. I believe it's before Carter takes office. And this is really Brzezinski's thesis and Brzezinski is a Rockefeller man. He is a co-founder of the Trilateral Commission. It, it's really fascinating that he has assumed this kind of position in the heart of the American sort of oligarchy as their, their man who's got one foot in the world of like Rockefeller, you know, corporate America, Trilateral Commission, CFR. And then he's also, you know, working in the, in the government and formulating, hatching these mad plots. But it really gets ramped. So as Carter, to his you know detriment, I think, listens to Brzezinski and, and thinks that that's a way he'll he'll somehow win over these more conservative parts of the establishment. Doesn't work. Uh, basically, David Rockefeller switches camps and joins the conspiracy, the October counter surprise or whatever. You end up with Reagan. How does Reagan and that nightmarish group of uh, criminals? Uh, how do they? Uh, take take what Carter began and just ramp it up, you know, exponentially. Right. So I think that, you know, the 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 first big assist that they got was or sh the, the, this policy got uh, as like a shot in the arm was from Bill Casey, because um, the CIA is like it's very interesting, um, especially by these years as an entity, because, the, you know, there as ever, there's a lot of people, particularly within its intelligence and analysis division who, whatever their politics, um, are probably, you know, more just fundamentally like restrained and conservative in their interpretations. But those people don't necessarily hold the power and they, they often don't. And in the case of the early 1980s in the Reagan White House, they really did not hold sway. That was, uh, you know, I would say that like the, the real power in those, um, the real power and, you know, at that point was held by Bill Casey. Uh, who was the ultimate like dirty tricks guy? He had been in, in the OSS. He was an old fucking man. Um, he had this like really uh, you know sort of archaic you know idea of what war against the Soviet Union you know could be. Uh, you know, just like would archaic be in the sense that like I don't think that there had ever been since the days of Dulles a uh, a, a, a direct agency director who is as willing to just throw as much shit at the fan as he was. And it basically allowed, I, I would argue, like, you know, a ton of different, like, kind of um, congruous plots to uh, emerge. So, you know, Afghanistan, right, I think, when, and I make, I've made this point elsewhere, but, like, 
Bill Casey talks about how, you know, and this isn't a Bob Woodward book about how, like when the, when the Iran Contra scandal is breaking um, and he died right, right, you know, right, right. As it was, as, as developments were just getting good. Um, he, uh, he was in really poor health. It was probably like, it, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, it, just look at a People can look at a picture of him. Um, but he, you know, talked to Woodward, but I was like, yeah, well, you know, we fucked up. Like we, 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 we mixed up the Contra money and we used the, so those accounts for money that we were sending to the Mujahideen. And that was a problem. And it's like, well, you know, what does that tell you? about the Afghanistan operation and how these guys viewed it, that it was like, and, and rather how they viewed Iran Contra, that they were running, you know, these two things, one very popular, one very illegal um, side by side. And yeah, to me, I think that there's a, like, you know, that's kind of characteristic of how, you know, what, what, what the temperature change was. And then the, just the dollar amounts just start getting larger. You know, we, we just start pumping military aid into um you know these are the years of the weinberger you know the reagan spend up we are doing you know, we have a large amount of military expenditure and um our arms exports are you know in, in an age of you know relative deindustrialization american arms exports like held pretty steady comparatively speaking and a lot of those arms you know that had previously gone to people like Iran, they now go to places like Pakistan, not just for the Muj, but to like build this state that is now better able to steer billions of dollars on an annual basis, much of which they siphon, um, that's going into this battle, excuse me, that's going into this battleground. Right. Um, one of the, the sources that you rely on in the, in the show is Peter Dale Scott's book, The Road to 9-11, and, you know, maybe even a subtitle for this season could be called the road to nine 11. Uh, and the, you know, nine 11 is one of those events that Scott calls a structural deep event. And, you know, the way he defines a deep event is one that uh, involves law breaking or violence that are embedded in co ongoing covert processes are mysterious to begin with and have consequences that enlarge covert government. Uh, and one way to look at the, uh, the covert, uh, support for the Mujahideen and uh, is like the start of these ongoing covert processes that are ongoing through the 90s uh, and right up to 9-11. And one of those, uh, you know, the the major historical events was the breakup of Yugoslavia. And, and there we see some of these same people, some of these same uh, Al-Qaeda types, some of these same uh, Mujahideen, uh, you know, CIA connected figures deeply embedded in uh, in that conflict there so uh, talk a little bit about that and how that relates to you know the ongoing covert uh, processes that led to uh and are reflected in 9 11. sure so i think the 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 simplest way to put it is that afghanistan in addition to being a conflict that generates all these fighters and all this misery um and you know th that's there uh, once the conflict starts to wind down as a conflict against the Afghan communist government after the Soviet withdrawal, um, those fighters actually have to start figuring out like where they're going to go next because the warlords who are the former, you know, like the Afghan like warlords who were previously Mujahideen commanders, people like Ahmed Shah Massoud, Ismail Khan, um, uh, Golbadin Hekmatyar, and so forth, they just basically begin tearing each other to bits. Um, uh, and 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 it's a it's a it, it's a a struggle that basically co it commences in ninety two like it begins in ninety two and then the Taliban rise you know the ISI back this sort of like you know upstart movement of you know hyper religious rural partisans um, and the you know all the while like that's happening in Afghanistan. Well, what happened to like these huge legions of fighters who were called the Afghan Arabs that had showed up there? And these Afghan Arabs, the name is a bit of a misnomer. What it really means is like all these people who are basically, you know, like like jihadists, um, Islamic fundamentalists, Islamists who militant Islamists who came to Afghanistan because they saw that as the place where they could be, you know, they could do the most damage against uh, Satan. Uh, in this case, you know, in their, in their case, in that, in that instance, the Soviet Union. Um, however, you know, these people like, like they weren't going to stop. They didn't want to stop fighting uh, when the war in Afghanistan ended. 
And so they made their ways, uh, they made their way to all, you know, all over the globe. And this became, you know, it was part of the Moro, you know, some of these rebels ended up in the Philippines as part of the Moro insurgency. Um, some ended up, as Bryce was just saying, in, you know, the former Yugoslavia uh, fighting in the fighting in the Balkans. Um, the Kosovo Liberation Army has was was essentially an Al Qaeda franchise, um, at least in its constitution uh, or how it was formed. Um, yeah, I think that there's a you know what, what you can see in that is that you know th th there's a few ways to look at it. Is that like oh well these guys are just kind of like you know the random detritus that's you know um, like you know flying around uh, you know the globe. You know, it's just it's it's the, just like the dregs of war, these people. Or you can think of this as like, well, like, you know, a lot of these people were cultivated by intelligence services. Um, you know, the American, you know, uh, government, for example, cultivated um, guys who were doing all sorts of terrorist activity in different parts of the globe at this time. And we kept mum about it or even supported them in some actions because it was convenient. Um, you know, in fact, there, you know, on the the first arrest warrant for Osama bin Laden came from Libya because they were trying, they were pissed about the fact that Al Qaeda had been, you know, like organizing attacks and uh, in collaboration with people who it turned out, I believe, were, were supported by the British. And there was a whole, me you know, and, and, and they, the warrant was itself like the fact that it was Libya that had, that had been the, uh, you know, that, that it's that there was the, um, uh, offended party uh, was scrubbed kind of indicates, I think, to the fact that like, well, like a lot of these relationships, you know, they are part of, you know, they are, they are submerged. They are uh, not made very clear. And so when you arrive at an event like 9-11, like the 1990s and where a lot of the people who are part of Al-Qaeda, people who we know had, you know, contributed, uh, whether in material or ideas to the 9-11 plot, um, you know, we know that our government had long relations with them. And we know that, you know, for example, this one guy, Ali Muhammad, who we know we taught Al Qaeda guys to do stuff with box cutters on planes. Uh, you know, he's in, he's, he is in custody at this moment. We still don't exactly know if he's sentenced or what, you know, what, what, what his status is and, and what he has to say. Um, and this is somebody who is admitted and, you know, it's in a court of law that we know to have been both a CIA and FBI asset. So the extent to which we have a realistic, idea, you know, it, it's, it's an open question to what extent we really, uh, you know, even know about the scope of, to which our government viewed these forces uh, to bar, you know, like the collective, you know, Mick Jihad, as it were, this kind of Western directed Islamist, Islamist current, um, you know, it's hard to say uh how it uh, yeah it's i mean it's it's a it's a it's a very um it's a it's it's a intentionally difficult and obscure thing um and it's not really even acknowledged in polite society or by our media yeah to me that I, that is a uh, a real question of methodology as you're trying to produce these these works and look at them how how much do you want to point to what to the implications of some of these things, because when you look at that McJihad era of the 1990s, um, you see that they, it begins really right after the Cold War in Azerbaijan, like 1991. Immediately, you, got, you have Al Qaeda figures, heroin, big oil companies, Exeron Contra people, and it's jihadi the whole networks. Thing. And was it, that was that the one where Richard Seekard showed up? Richard Secord yeah. and Ed Dearborn yeah. and Mega Oil, and nobody really knows if and Mega Oil was an oil intelligence operation, like if it wasn't even affiliated with the government or if it was the CIA or if it was some sort of safari club thing. We don't even know anything about it to this day. And it's from there that it really begins because, and right before 9-11, a lot of the calls of the hijackers were to, you know, uh, to, to Baku, which is, you know, Azerbaijan. So it, it's like, it's right there. How did you, and, and you also talk about the ways in which people like George Tenet and uh, other, you know, Kofor Black, these other characters, uh, Richard Blee, I think comes up and um, uh, another, there's another fellow whose name escapes me. but he's Tom Wilshire. Those. Yeah, Wilshire, Wilshire. thank <laughs> you. Uh, yeah, but if Ben Howard was here, he would jump in with that immediately. But this is more, this is only my semi wheelhouse. But 
how did and the, the more you look at these it's just like look they are obviously what they did clearly facilitated these attacks and these attacks were very much in line with their agenda which would have been very difficult to accomplish otherwise so the, you leave the like that's all stuff that people will understand if they're really steeped in this but you you're pretty cautious in terms of analysis but you throw a lot of empirical evidence out there What's your general approach on how to even deal with these issues that are so psychologically, uh, that, that, that have these taboos around them and that are so radioactive that like, it's hard to even know how to say like, um, here's a few things you might be interested in learning about and you know maybe draw your own conclusions. But I mean, what kind of, of approach did you have going in as you started to do this? Because it's quite difficult to piece these things together in the first place, but then to like figure out how to do it in the most effective way is a whole other ballgame. So. What are your thoughts on this here? Yeah, I think for us, the simplest answer to that is is that you know we're we're interested in in yes, like doing this research and you know like a kind of you know deep history, but also we're really interested in storytelling, and we're really interested in figuring out a way to present this, uh, you know, in a fashion that is narratively satisfying to people, and I think for us, you know, the oftentimes like the agenda uh, that we're kind of driving at is, you know, best illustrated through the kinds of stories that we're able to tell and the way that we can frame facts that way. So to the degree that we're, you know, where it's like, it feels like we're not connecting dots or whatever, it is usually, I think, because like the impulse that we're sort of acting out is like one where we want to perfectly balance the amount of information that we can kind of give people while also retaining, you know, the kind of, uh, like the, the 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 just what needs to be there, uh, you know, like just the amount of meat that needs to be on the bone for uh, the you know for it to feel like a story with like motion that people can feel invested in. Because I think a lot of part of what makes something like you know the, these particularly deep events um, difficult to narrativize in general is that like you know a lot of what you're explaining about them are the ways in which like these different figures are you know who are and you know have different relationships to and to a given phenomenon you know whether it's a war or a terrorist attack or whatever um and to one another and um you know it's especially because uh you know this is your you know that we're, we're we're working in the in the ruins of many failed investigations um i think it's it's definitely you know it's 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 always kind of a it, it, it definitely helps me to think about it as like, all right, well, what can I take from this that can get people to, you know, have like a keyhole perspective on this thing without feeling like I'm going to, you know, without, without like we're, without feeling that we're getting bogged down and that people feel like lost or that like they've lost, like we've lost momentum in the story. And you do that pretty, pretty darn well. I mean, one of the things I really appreciate about your program is that you give the sources and you give books and you give names and you have interviews with all these people so that if anyone wants to pull on any one of these strings, you give them the tools to do that. Which, yes. You know, See, season four sources that. will be up soon, by the way. But um, that's the other thing is worth pointing out is like, I think that the um, it's a very uh, easy like it's exactly like it's it's so easy like if somebody like hears like a fact you know from our show that like sticks in their brain or whatever like they can go you know eventually they'll be able you know like, like you know they'll be able to google it or get a sense of it or figure out like like, like it's it's we we try not to make it too difficult for people to get you know if they want to learn more about something to figure out like where they can so where can people watch or listen to blowback they can listen to Blowback. Go to www.blowback.show. And uh, it's a so we have a free episode right now that is available wherever you get your podcasts. Um, that's our first episode of our new season. And if you want to listen to the whole thing, it's 25 bucks and you get it all and our whole our, all of our past seasons all for free. Um, or sorry, not for free, ad free. Um, and that is, uh, that's a blowback.show. And then eventually we will be releasing the rest of season four, uh, on a week by week basis, but should be before the end of the year, we'll start doing that. And then, um, the, uh, soundtrack, Brennan, he like composes all the music himself. Uh, it comes out, uh, in two weeks ish, I guess on September 25th. And yeah, I mean, that's, uh, 
if you want to, if you, if I, I would, I, I think uh, your listeners and viewers would, would love the show and I urge them to check it out. Yeah, I would say to people out there uh, that it is worth checking out. Uh, the cost is about like what you pay for an audiobook, and it's uh, better produced than most audiobooks, which are typically just a, some guy reading something. So I think it's worth the uh, investment for people that are interested in this material. And uh, Noah Cohen, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Devil's Chess Club is an American exception production. Special thanks to Dana Chavaria for producing this episode and to Casey Moore for the graphics. To get first access to episodes of Devil's Chess Club, please subscribe to the American Exception podcast on Patreon. Subscribers get access not only to Devil's Chess Club, but to the rest of the American Exception podcast. Many episodes, 150 and counting, dealing with the deep, dark politics of U.S. Empire. After that, you can find episodes on Rockfin Premium before they eventually get posted to YouTube on a new Devil's Chess Club playlist on the American Exception YouTube channel. Friends, remember that if we're going to beat the devil, we gotta know how he plays his games. That's why Devil's Chess Club is here. <laughs>